just uh, so I think the recording's running already. Perfect. So welcome to um, Integration Monday. I'm jumping ahead of myself there. Um, tonight we're joined by Nick from uh, QuickLearn, and Nick's going to um, share with us some information about push triggers for logic apps. And I think a bit like um, about last week when Ashwin was talking about logic apps. I, from a community spe uh, perspective, Nick and Ashwin are the two guys I'm, I'm seeing doing the uh, the most stuff with logic apps. Certainly in the you know in the kind of Yammer groups we have in in the um, MVP program and stuff there, they're always talking about it. So I think this is a great opportunity to um, have a couple of back-to-back -back logic app sessions and, and kind of find out what the guys are, are sort of trying out and what what use cases they're playing around with. So before I hand over to Nick, then just a little bit of um, additional information. So I think we're about um, just over a week away from Azure Hybrid Integration Day in Canada. Um, so if anybody um, is around that area, you know, kind of pop along. We've got a really great event lined up there. And I guess um, one other thing, if anybody's got user groups who they want me to do a bit of a shout out for about any events coming up, um, I guess we can pop a slide in here and, and you know, if people have an event coming in, it's it's like a month out or something, just drop us a note and we'll, we'll pop it in there to make sure people are aware of it. Um, so if you're new to Integration Monday, there's a couple of names I don't recognize tonight, so um, welcome. If this is the 7.30 p.m. webcast we run every week. Um, the idea is to give people a chance to, who want to come and share some stuff with us about things they're learning about or new technologies they're playing with. Um, the topic areas tend to focus on Azure-based integration, and um, you know we've had a whole bunch of people from both the product teams, MVP community, and the wider user group communities who join us. And um, the idea is just to keep content coming pretty much every week. Um, to kind of make it interactive, we've got um, the ability for people to kind of ask questions via the Q&A forum. So at the end of Nick's session, I'll go through the questions with them and we can discuss anything um, people want to kind of throw up as a question. We can also um, use Hash Integration Monday on Twitter if anybody wants to pop anything in there. Sorry, I think my phone's going in the background, so I'm going to mute that. Um, and also we have the Integration User Group website has a discussion forum, so if anybody's got a question that they think of later, if you pop it on the forum and we can pass that on to Nick. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, just a little bit of information on sessions in the coming weeks. So next week um, we've got a, a session I've just added today, which is um, Rick Hepworth, who's going to be talking about Azure Resource Manager. So I think if anybody's doing you know, kind of management of Azure resources. That's going to be a session you'll find particularly interesting. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of um, stuff in the community about people starting to use that. But I saw a session by Rick recently, which was um, really top notch, and he's going to share some of that with us. But he's got a session coming up in a, in a week or so's time. So he's, he's been doing some updates for that, and he's going to kind of um, tell us all the, all the really good stuff about Resource Manager. Um, Howard's going to be following um, two weeks after that, so the week after the 26th, so let me check what the date is for that. Um, so I think the 2nd of November, we're going to have a break that week, because um, I think a lot of people are going to be away um, over in, in Seattle. So the next session after that's going to be the 9th of November, and Howard's going to be um, continuing the topic he did a few weeks ago where he introduced Document DB, and he's going to be progressing that um, that series of HL7 integration in the cloud um, a little bit further. Then we've got uh, Big Badrin and Simon Doy and I are going to kind of co-present a session a few weeks after that um, on the 23rd talking about Office 365 integration. And um, so hopefully you can kind of see that the, the talks for the coming weeks are all coming together quite nicely. But at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to Nick now and um, let Nick talk about Logic Apps. Sounds good. All right, so I'm um, going to go ahead. Actually, that was, uh, I have two machines that's uh, sending control to my other one, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over, hopefully, to the other machine. There we go. And uh, put that up on screen. Great, that's going right. through nicely. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so this is uh, titled Building Push Triggers for Logic Apps. And uh, 
it is a pretty generic sounding title, but we definitely are going to be rooting it in uh, a few different scenarios that I at least find entertaining. Uh, and then we'll kind of see how that uh, plays out from there. I also want to make it so that this is something that after the talk, you can actually do something with it. Uh, I don't really find enjoyable talks where I just watch something happen and then uh, you know, a week later uh, I try to make something happen with it and I find myself sorting through slides and all of that. So in this case, all of my code is already posted. Uh, you can already go and uh, download that code and for any of the hardware build outs that I have, uh, later in this uh, presentation. I've uh, basically put up buy lists for all the parts and uh, diagrams and schematics and all of that is openly available. So I hope this is a really enjoyable talk and one that's actually actionable. All right, so um, I can start with an introduction about myself and I was going to, but I'm not really going to say a lot here other than to say that even though I'm talking about logic apps, uh, my entry point into integration was not with Logic Apps. It was with BizTalk Server. I uh, wasn't uh, starting as early as uh, uh, some of the people probably on this call. I came in the 2006 timeframe. Things were really nicely established. It was already uh, you know, a nice .NET engine for uh, doing integration. It was a beautiful thing. Uh, since then, I've been working uh, over at Quick Learn Training, putting together uh, blog posts, conference talks, courses, and uh, kind of going all over the world and uh, helping people out with BizTalk Server. Also got the rights to display all those little nifty icons at the bottom. Uh, there was one I didn't include. I actually bought the royalties, uh, or no, sorry, I bought the rights rather to uh, use without royalties a little uh, icon of a T-Rex, but it didn't really fit with the rest of it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and continue on and start this talk with a story. Now, as I'm telling this story, know that we're actually going to be going some really cool places. So uh, this is going to be one where we're going to see integration of Logic Apps with uh, not only desktop apps and uh, you know, tablet apps, but also phone apps and even uh, embedded applications, if you could really call it that. It's Windows Universal apps on a uh, Windows IoT core system. Uh, so that's where we're going, but again, we're going to root it in scenario as we go along. Now, the first story we're going to start with is one that I'm all too familiar with as either an attendee or exhibitor at technical conferences. Now, the wonderful thing about technical conferences, besides all of the, uh, uh, the free food, free drinks, free devices, depending on which one you end up at, is all the wonderful swag and the wonderful uh, experiences you can have meeting with people at uh, exhibition booths. So I've worked at a few of those. I've been on both sides of the booth. And one thing that always bothered me was uh, the use of NFC tags in our attendee badges. Because it seemed to be all for show. Right? We have this wonderful badge that inside of it has uh, more or less the digital imprint of information uh, that could be basically stored on a business card otherwise. And it looks really slick, right? So our attendees walk up to the booth, or I'm walking up to someone else's booth, I'm looking for the swag, I make eye contact, that means, okay, a badge scan is going to happen. They reach out, they scan my badge, it's on a device that can read that badge, gets all the data, and then theoretically does magical stuff with it. But the, the sad reality is that after the conference, there's really ugly stuff happening with that data it gets retrieved from the device in CSV format. So we did a really slick interaction to zap it off the badge, but then we go back to the 90s and put it into CSV format. And uh, then we email that around a little bit. Uh, usually it's the conference organizers that get that information. Maybe it goes out in an email attachment to uh, each uh, exhibitor. Maybe it goes to a website that you go and download that from. Uh, but either way, that, that file is passed around and eventually the end goal is to, to make contact with those people that, that came to the booth. So we eventually get it imported into a CRM system. Maybe that's a BizTalk server sucking up the email. That would be great. But maybe in reality it's someone downloading that to their hard drive, going to a website and uploading it, and eventually getting data in a database. Now, I have a question for you that's been bugging me, and maybe uh, one of you has the answer in your mind right now, but what are we really accomplishing by doing this whiz-bang flashy thing on the front end with all this gory mess on the back end. That couldn't have been done with a business card. Like what if I just handed someone my business card? Really all this is is I'm having automatic transcription of the data into a digital form and then I'm making a kind of a chaotic approach to the database for a landing. And I would propose that in a world where we have a tag 
built into a conference badge with information that I can zap off wirelessly, then it should be possible to not do all of that in between, but instead make the leap directly from the device to the place that that data should rest. There has to be a better way. And uh, I think in hearing a talk a few years back uh, over at the Microsoft campus, there was this uh, conference called the ALM Summit. And James Whitaker, he used to work for Google, he was a specialist in automated tests. He was talking and uh, he was discussing the three eras of computing. And I think the reason that that question bothered me so much about you know, what are we really gaining out of this is because that scenario reeked, it smelled of store and compute. The era where we built applications against files and that was really all we thought about. Maybe a database here and there. But that era has been kind of superseded and, and replaced even though it still exists. So we saw the rise of search and browse, which kind of centered around web pages. Now, uh, James Whitaker proposed, and I agree, that we're now in the know and do era. Not store and compute, not search and browse, but know and do. And it's not built around apps, even though apps tend to take uh, kind of the forefront. Uh, definitely APIs are there. But in reality, it's not about any of that. It's about experiences that allow me to be wherever I need to be, on any device I need to be, on <laughs> and still have access to the same data and the same experience where these devices use signals and information to become my agents of doing my will. Pretty cool era. So what, is, what does that look like to have an experience? What does that mean? I don't go file new experience in Visual Studio. So what's an experience? Well, really take any device that had the word smart jammed in front of it at the beginning of the 2000s, and you'll find something that's a candidate for an experience. So uh, one of those would be the smart fridge. So a refrigerator, nice appliance, keeps your food cold, and that's been fine for decades. But we have computers now, so wouldn't it be awesome if the first generation of a smart fridge was that we put a tablet on the door, and that tablet could have apps like knowing what food is in the fridge and Pandora and Spotify so I can play music while I'm cooking my food. Well, that was the first generation. That was what was envisioned for the first generation of a smart fridge. The second generation, you know, finally had some common sense. Someone finally asked the question, why do we have the tablet on the fridge? Why are we storing the data on the fridge? Why does the fridge care what's in the fridge? Why isn't that just an app where I go to the grocery store where I'm actually acquiring the food, scan the barcodes or maybe even just scan the receipt on my phone, and it knows what's in the fridge. It doesn't necessarily have to be built on the fridge door. And maybe no matter then where I am, I can know, hey, what's in the fridge right now? I'm sitting on my couch. That's the important place to know what's in the fridge. Is it worth getting up? <laughs> All right, so maybe that, maybe that doesn't translate. Maybe you're saying, yes, it does, because I need exercise. OK, go ahead, go and look. But also the second generation added some really cool stuff, like local device communication. You know, knowing if I am about to cook a recipe, being able to call that up on my phone saying, yes, I want to cook this recipe. Do I have all the food? My fridge says I have all the food, and it can talk to my oven and set the temperature to preheat it. Now, I would propose that in addition to being in the know and do era, we are on the cusp of the third generation of that era, the third era, of, or the third generation of the third era, if that's even a thing, right, which is the generation of integration. Which is where we say, why are we keeping ourselves locked within the domain of food? You know, a fridge is, is really cool. It deals in keeping food cold. But we're already pulling the com uh, computational power outside the fridge. It doesn't really need a computer built into it to do really cool things. Maybe it just needs sensors. Maybe it's an input device into logic that lives somewhere else. And of course, I have to throw some buzzwords in there. So why not social integration? You might. You might say, no, that's ridiculous. Social integration for a fridge. I'm signing off this meeting right now. But bear with me. Here we go. Imagine you're sitting on your couch, and you get a text from your fridge. Now, this happens, right? I get a text from my car saying, hey, your, your health report is ready. <laughs> go look at it and pay the dealership money. Um, but the fridge sends me a text, and it says, your favorite sports team is playing tomorrow. In other words, it's using some signals. I talk a lot about the, the Seattle Seahawks on Facebook, right? It might use that signal. It might know what their schedule is. It might know that I have an event where I've invited Alice and Bob over, 
and I don't drink beer a lot, so I don't have a lot of beer in my fridge, and maybe that's wrong, and maybe I should have a lot of beer in my fridge just to be hospitable. And my fridge knows that. Or really, it's not my fridge. It's probably some logic somewhere else, maybe uh, some rules that have been evaluated in the cloud. And so it might ask me if I would like to get some more beer. Now, what if I said yes, and it then acts as my agent to integrate with grocery stores in the area and not surface ads in my face and say, hey, you should buy some laundry detergent while you're at it because it looks like it could be a messy party. But instead, gives me offers. It knows that I need beer. And so maybe it says, hey, I, I have some offers out there. Do you need a six pack or a full case? Because maybe we can make something work. And maybe then we have an economy built around the data of you know, what those offers are, what the inventory is, what all of this stuff is that's happening. And we have a place where integration is taking this outside of just the realm of food, but bringing it into uh, my life. So what are we really getting at? We're looking kind of at IoT, but we're not. We're looking at integration. Integration has been there for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades. As long as we've had data, we've had to do some kind of integration. So what happens when integration meets the third era of computing? What happens when it meets IoT? What happens when it meets all these other things that we're seeing? Really what's happening is we have this Internet of Things out there which give us smart things, but that really doesn't help us that much. It's, it's nifty. It's novel. When we have all of these random buzzwords and ad integration, we get magical things. And so I'm really happy to be talking to this group because this is the group that actually makes software magical. And I don't throw around the term magic that often because it's ridiculous. But when it comes to integration, it's true. That's the, the feeling that we instill in people that experience our solutions. It just works. It's magical. Now, logic apps help to enable experiences. So I might not have file new experience in Visual Studio. I might not have you know, the experience option in the Azure marketplace. But logic apps can play a part in connecting uh, sensors, signals, devices, services, whatever. So what are logic apps? And why are we talking about those instead of BizTalk? Because certainly I could do the same stuff with BizTalk, just look a little bit different. Well, logic apps are a framework for building and running cloud-hosted workflows that are comprised of API apps, which are really just web API projects in uh, Visual Studio that have been deployed out to an Azure website container. And those typically provide either behaviors or connections. So you can think about those in terms of adapters and pipeline components. Now notice I didn't say the word orchestration anywhere because at the moment we don't have transactionality, we don't have uh, correlation in a, in a really real sense. With logic apps we have basically adapters and pipeline components. And of course with the help of service bus we can opt into pub sub capabilities. So we can get some of the experience of BizTalk server already today in the cloud with logic apps. So going back, rewinding a little bit off of the, the soapbox, to the tech conference where we were scanning badges instead of just taking business cards because it saved us some extra typing. What does a technical conference experience look like? Well, maybe during the conference, all of the same stuff is happening. We're still going to be scanning the attendee badge. We're still going to you know, do the, uh, can I take the swag? Not, you know, I'm not here for the swag, but I kind of am going to take it anyway. Are we going to do that little dance? Yes. Are we going to scan the badge? Of course, because we have flashy technology to do it. But what we're not going to do is something horrific. Instead, we're going to scan the data, and that scan data is going to be sent to an awaiting logic app. Now, we have a few options. Again, we already mentioned service bus. That would be fantastic. Just publish the data out to the bus and not care where it ends up. But we're going to be talking about uh, push triggers in this, uh, in this um, uh, talk, so we're definitely going to be focusing on what if I want to direct push it to that logic app. And then after the logic app receives it, it creates leads in the CRM system. Now, that doesn't sound magical yet. That just sounds like, okay, we're, we're shuffling data around, we're just doing it kind of in an automated way in the cloud. It becomes magical when we integrate with other things as well. When we start thinking about other signals we have to enrich that data. Magic happens through enrichment. So if you want to talk integration patterns, talk enrichment when you're doing it. So those leads, 
that we're meeting, those people that could be potential sales one day, maybe, probably not. Maybe we can qualify and disqualify them based on publicly available company data. So we go out, we look up data about their company, we realize that their, their overall operating budget, or even just the total value of the company as a whole, is less than our cheapest product. There's no way we're ever going to sell them anything, but I'm very happy that they enjoyed our swag, and I hope that they give that to someone or show it to someone who could spend money with our company. So we have that automatic qualification. Maybe I know when and where that information was ingested. I had a, a GPS coordinate, I had a date where we read the badge. Based on that information and looking at the calendar, I know what conference they were at, and maybe there's a targeted campaign I can start. Uh, you know, slowly sending them emails, hey, we saw you at this conference, but of course giving them the ability to opt out. Still getting emails from TechEd back in, uh, it was like 2011, there's this one company with their drip campaign, won't stop. Uh, anyway, so we could do that. And we could apply really good integration practices to this, so we could, you know, look at that and say, well, that might be good for, you know, do, doing some normalization on that, because we get leads through other ways, maybe someone walks through the front door of the company. Are they not still a lead? Do we still not want to do these same processes? Certainly. So maybe our, our process is we receive the data, we normalize that data into kind of an event about a lead showing up, and then that gets published to a bus that uh, we have subscribers that do all the rest. And so that's great, and we can do that. But how do we do step four? Because step four is where we actually get to build something that's interesting for the purposes of this talk. How do we actually get the data to the logic app? So how we trigger a logic app is through an API app that serves as a trigger. Now that trigger can be a polling trigger where it you know, basically checks for data over and over and over, or it can be a push trigger where we just kind of in an inventing way send the data. So how do push triggers work? Well in this case we start with the source of the data. So our source of the data is probably going to be some sort of app on a device that can read NFC tags. So maybe it's a phone app. In fact, it's a Windows Universal app, so it doesn't really matter. It can run on my phone, it can run on my tablet, and that's great. But how does the Logic app register its interest in those tag reads? How does it say, I want to know about these and eventually actually see them? Well, it does that through our push trigger. So our push trigger itself isn't what received the data. It's something else. It's our tag read app. The push trigger is what the logic app uses to say it wants the data. So when we're writing a push trigger API app, what we're really responsible for is getting the callback information from the logic app. The logic app will say, hey, I'm interested in tag reads. It might even give us some configuration. I'm interested in tag reads as long as it's not the one you last sent me or as long as it happens on a Tuesday, you know, whatever it might be. And uh, then it might say, once you have a tag read, send me a request at this URL with these credentials. So it gives you a callback address. Here's where to call me back. And it becomes the job of our push trigger API app to then store that data somewhere. So it basically just says callback storage here on the slide, but that callback storage can take any form. So within the course of this talk, we're going to see both an Azure mobile app used as our callback storage, which, by the way, if you kind of follow that all the way to the bottom, it's just a SQL database. And uh, we're also going to use Azure Table Storage uh, for a uh, callback storage mechanism. So the, the Azure Table Storage one is the one that uh, uh, I'm going to be giving to you as homework at the end uh, of class, basically one that you can go download, you can build this really cool thing, and uh, be able to use that at a really low cost. All right, so Azure Table Storage, pretty decent uh, place for storing those addresses that we can call back our logic apps. All right, so once we have that, how do we make use of that? Well, we are going to have to make some modifications to our phone app. We're going to have to make some modifications so that whenever there's a tag read that happens, we actually read the data from the callback store and then actually invoke that callback. So we send a post of the, the data that we have to the callback URL for that logic app. So that's what that's going to look like to build on. We're actually going to build this uh, in, in this uh, session. Now you might be looking at that and saying, wow, uh, you lost me. That was a bunch of Azure Logic App stuff. Can you explain this in BizTalk terms? Because uh, BizTalk Server is a much more mature, reliable platform that is uh, 
uh, you know, makes me happy on the inside. Makes me happy on the inside too. That's a true statement. Uh, so imagine, in the case of BizTalk Server, that we're building the Azure equivalent of a BizTalk Server receive adapter. All right, it just receives data in an event-driven fashion. So that's about the level of difficulty that we would kind of expect on the BizTalk Server side. Is we're building a receive adapter. All right. So with that in mind, knowing that we can easily do that using the WCF LOB adapter SDK, pretty nice. Gives you a lot of stuff out of the box, pre-generated. You only have to write a little bit of uh, boilerplate code and then your actual code. What does it look like, though, in the API app world? Well, first of all, before we actually get to writing a push trigger, we do have to know some general things about API apps. So I'm going to give you a really brief introduction to that world. For a much longer introduction to this world, we're actually hosting a hackathon event this weekend. And uh, you'll get basically a whole day worth of how to build this stuff. This is a crazy abbreviated form, so uh, just keep that in mind. So if you go out right now after installing the Azure SDK to either Visual Studio 2013 or Visual Studio 2015, what you will not see is a project template for push trigger. You can look for it all day, you won't find it. What you will find is an ASP.NET web application template. So we're going to start with that template because once we do that, we actually get a secondary dialog where it asks us what kind of web application, and that's where we find Azure API app. Now, Azure API apps, the steps within our logic apps can take a lot of different forms. They could be connectors where we're uh, receiving data or we're sending data to external systems. So in the case of our push trigger, it's kind of a connector. It could be just a behavior that happens in the middle. So imagine like a pipeline component where, hey, I have this data. I need to transform it in some way, translate it in some way, uh, you know, or do some other uh, work on this data in some way. We might write an API app for that. But they basically look like web API applications. So it's very much a website that has endpoints that I can post, put, delete, get data at. All right, so we're going to go ahead and continue on with that template, and we'll find that we're going to need to know some terminology. Right up front, there's going to be uh, controllers within there. So if I look in the project structure that it creates, there's a values controller uh, .cs. Now, a controller uh, is basically going to be a class that has your API logic inside. Now, there's going to be methods there that are designed to handle incoming HTTP requests, and we know which method gets called based on the route that the request came in at. So basically, what was the address that we typed? How do we route that to the method? There's also going to be another term that we might uh, throw out there, which is models. That's the shape of the API inputs and outputs. All right, so we're going to deal with uh, models, controllers, routes, and things like that as we're building out a web API app. Another thing that we're going to have to deal with is metadata. So having a, a RESTful API is really nice. Having an HTTP API is really nice if I don't build it RESTfully. Um, but it's another thing to be able to actually consume that easily from uh, tools or from generated code. And the best way to do that is metadata, regardless of the form that the service takes. Now, rather than using WSDL metadata, uh, the team that uh, is building out logic apps and, and working with API apps decided to use Swagger instead. So Swagger. Uh, is a metadata format that is uh, JSON based, so it's not XML based. You're going to be looking at JSON markup. And uh, we actually use a NuGet package called Swashbuckle, which is for .NET, to generate Swagger metadata. So within the API app project, there's a Swagger config.cs that has just tons and tons of comments about here's how you could configure Swashbuckle to generate appropriate metadata for your application. And so that's fine and great because the Logic App Designer can natively consume web APIs. The cards within the designer will show all the possible operations. Unfortunately, those operations parameters might have really unfriendly names. They might lack meaningful descriptions. And so we can add metadata to our apps to make them more friendly in the Logic App Designer. I actually faced this pretty early on with uh, the Logic Apps world. I was building out custom API apps, and they just looked awful. Gone to the designer, they had generated names for everything, and it didn't, you know, it didn't look like the built-in stuff. 
And I found that it was possible to get that built-in look if I wrote filters for the data that Swashbuckle was generating. So all the metadata that's coming out of Swashbuckle, we can actually control and hook in. Rather than having, uh, having us have to write filters ever again uh, for simple API apps and simple triggers, I decided just to bake the logic into a NuGet package. So we can get that now in the form of the T-Rex metadata library. And so that gives us .NET attributes that we can use on our classes, on our uh, you know, class members for our models to describe what they're about. So that when they're used in the Logic App Designer, it makes sense. It's also going to provide uh, swashbuckle filters that control how the metadata is generated. To enable those filters and actually make the metadata mean something, you do have to include a fairly silly line of code uh, within your uh, Swagger config file, which will look something like this. C, which is the configuration object, dot, there's an extension method titled release the T-Rex. Now, if you're writing enterprise software, you might not feel like uh, typing out a very fanciful statement like that. In which case, you can feel free to wrap that in your own and call something more uh, professional sounding like enable T-Rex, although still you have a dinosaur within the title. So. Uh, have fun with trying to figure that one out, but with that, we have enough background to create a simple API app, but not necessarily a trigger. So what we're going to see as I start writing the code is that I'm going to be taking into account some special considerations for push triggers. The first one is that there's special metadata that has to be in place in the Swagger output that identifies certain operations as being the operations that the Logic App should call to register the callback. Now, the way that we do that, if we're using T-Rex, is to simply add the trigger attribute and then say that the trigger type is push trigger. The second thing that we're going to need to do is that the first parameter of that operation to register the callbacks so that the logic app can say, hey, I'm interested in this, is we have to have a trigger ID uh, string. And that trigger ID string is going to be automatically populated with the name of the logic app. And so that's a default that gets put in place, again, by the trigger attribute. It controls that. Another thing we have to do, <laughs> so there's a few more here, uh, is that the second parameter of the callback registration needs to include a way to pass in configuration. So imagine we had some sort of file push trigger. I want to be notified when a file shows up. Well, maybe we're going to have configuration like a file name mask or folder. Maybe we have configuration like, uh, you know, if I've seen the file before, ignore it. It's probably just the, the same one coming back. It's a duplicate. So we need to be able to specify configuration. The other thing that we need to be able to specify there, uh, for the sake of people that are trying to use the data out of this logic, or uh, this uh, push trigger, rather, is the shape of the output. So what does it look like when we actually have that event fire? And what, uh, what data is going to be coming through? Now, the way that we specify all that is by adding as our second parameter a parameter of type trigger input, which is a generic class that's part of the app service SDK, and it's just one of those boilerplate things that has to be there. Finally, within the method where we register the callback, we have to report that we received the callback, that everything is going to be fine. And the way that we do that is by calling an extension method on the request object called push trigger registered and we pass into that the URL that we heard from the Logic App just as a final confirmation that everything is on the up and up. At that point, if we wanted to kind of put that all together and see what the code might look like for a method where we're actually registering a callback, it might look something like this. We're going to have some metadata to indicate that this is a push trigger that returns uh, basically data uh, of that shape, sample push event model. It's going to have a description of receive simulated push. So as I'm looking in the designer at the card, the thing that triggers it that I'm clicking on to cause this trigger to be the thing that triggers the workflow is receive simulated push. We're going to have some just generic web API attributes like HTTP put to specify the verb that we're expecting, route to specify uh, basically the, the path relative for this method. It's assuming there's probably going to be a route prefix there at the controller level. And it's going to be passing in the trigger ID as part of the address. We're also going to see that we take in the trigger ID, and then finally from the body of the message, we're getting that trigger input. 
Now within this part of the code where we're actually writing the implementation, we're, oh, sorry, forgot the call outs there. Within the actual code where we have the implementation, we're going to use the push trigger register method to indicate that everything's successful. All right, so that's what it's going to look like when everything's put together. But watching slides is not as exciting as building it and also potentially breaking things and fixing them along the way. So that's what we're going to do now. So I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to go over to Visual Studio where I have a starting solution. And my starting solution is going to have three, product, uh, three projects. One of the projects is going to be an app that's going to be running uh, basically on the, the device side, in this case a phone. There's going to be the push trigger, which is going to be running in Azure. And the third project we'll see is going to include some data models that are shared between them. So I'm going to go out to that code, which actually, you know what? I'm going to launch Visual Studio as an administrator here and uh, do that the safe way just in case, as opposed to just double clicking it from the file folder. All right, so I'm running this from 2015. You can do that. You can run it in 2013 as well. Um, I tend to like 2015, so that's where I'm going to be running mine from. All right, so I'm going to open up that code, and we'll see those three projects, one that uh, lives up on Azure, one that will live on my device, and one that's shared. Now, as far as the device code is concerned, I'm starting out with a Windows 10 universal app that uh, basically has a fairly simplistic UI. So I'm going to open up the main page UI here so we can just kind of appreciate uh, the, that moment of zen of you know, launching that app for the first time. So essentially within the UI, there is a single text block that says scan NFC tags. And we can see that on a phone. That would work on a tablet. That works everywhere, and it does and shows the exact same thing. So that's obviously not where the, the magical portion of this is. In reality, the magical portion lives in the cloud, but uh, the actual code that does anything in the app is kind of spaghetti code in the code behind at the moment. And what we're doing here is we're grabbing uh, basically a, a handle to the current NFC reader. So the way that we do that is we call into proximity device dot get default uh, within Windows 8 and up our NFC readers are titled proximity sensors because you have to be close and they send the data off a tag or another device. So proximity device was the uh, fortunate or unfortunate class name. And so when we get default, we're just getting the default reader. And uh, I'm going to call the subscribe for message uh, method, which says wait for a tag to show up that has a message that's formatted in the in-depth format. So that's just a common format for uh, multi-part messages to be stored on tags. And those, uh, well, I should say multi-record messages. But anyway, one of those could be a virtual business card. In the case of uh, uh, this scenario here, they are virtual business cards. That could be a, uh, a URL, a simple link. Could be a whole bunch of different things. In this case, we're hoping that they have a virtual business card. But we'll notice that the push trigger that we're writing doesn't care. Just like if I was writing a BizTalk adapter, it was a file adapter. I don't care what kind of file I'm, I'm sucking in. I just care that it's a stream of bytes. And so I'm going to try to handle it in the same way that I would build a BizTalk adapter. I'm going to just handle this as a stream of bytes. I don't really care that it's a, a business card or a, a phone number or a URL. It's just a thing. It's a stream of data. And it's going to be within my logic app that will have uh, what amounts to uh, the equivalent of BizTalk pipeline components to translate that information and, and show me what it actually is. So for now, I'm going to be taking in to that subscribe for message or rather passing in, a lambda that accepts an instance of the reader, the message we received, and we're going to go into that message, grab the data that's inside, get it as a byte array. We're then going to translate that to text so that it's really easily uh, consumable as human beings as we're looking at what got caught in the breakpoint here. <laughs> uh, so we're going to see what the current tag read is, and then we're going to evaluate. Is this a duplicate of the last tag read that we saw? We're going to store what the last one uh, was that we saw from the current one. And then finally, before we actually get out to the Logic app, we're going to be converting this to a base64 representation. Ultimately, I'm going to be cramming this into uh, some JSON. And I don't want to have just a bunch of loose bytes. I'm going to have that nicely encoded in base64 array. So uh, I want to get that in that form so it's ready to go at that point. So let's see what this does right now. I'm going to go ahead and run this. 
I'm just going to run this locally. So what that will do is it's going to uh, do the NuGet package restore there. It's going to build it. It's going to deploy it as a uh, universal app on this machine that can execute. And then it's going to start executing with a debugger attached. Now at this point, uh, I actually have uh, uh, Lorraine Vance here of QuickLearn who has cinema, cinemata, uh, cinematic expertise, if I could talk. I can make up words too. Uh, cinematic expertise with webcams. And so she's going to be helping me out here as she points the camera to my NFC reader and uh, go ahead and turn that on. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and enable my camera. And you should be able to see my desk. I have a conference badge from a conference. Now, this one didn't actually have an NFC tag built in, so we stuck one on the back. We cheated. Uh, but if you were ever at Build, our Build ones have huge NFC tags. If you want to store tons and tons of data, these have amazing storage capacity, so you can use those. Uh, I also have another conference tag, which is what I imagine Scott Guthrie might carry around uh, if he was at a conference. Not quite a red polo, but uh, this is what I could get out of my uh, daughter's uh, Barbie clothes. All right, so I'm going to take my conference badge, and I'm going to scan it against my reader on my desk. So it's just a Sony NFC reader, uh, USB-based. And you can see that on my screen now, we've received that content. All right, so it's also at the same point hit a breakpoint in the code where we have a current tag read. And in my current tag read, I can see that virtual business card for myself. So I have my uh, you know, last name, my first name, my full name. Uh, I have my email address, nh at example.org, and uh, everything else. Now, you might be looking at that and saying, well, that's not a lot of data. Well, that's because the original place I was using to test this before I actually got these badges all nice and set up uh, was I was using my ring. I have an NFC-enabled ring, and it doesn't really have a lot of storage space. So uh, we can certainly fit a lot more data there on a proper uh, conference batch. All right, so with that, we have a read. That's good. So I'm going to go ahead and see that this is not a duplicate. So is duplicate. It's fading out there, but it's false. And I'm going to go ahead and continue. And I'm just going to read one more. We don't need the camera on this, though. And I'm going to scan that same tag once again against the reader. There we go. And we should see that in this case, we do have a duplicate tag read. So is duplicate is true. All right, so it's able to filter out and let us know if we have a duplicate. So that's awesome. We can read tags, we can see if they're duplicates, and we can throw that information away and not do anything with it. Hmm. We have to do some work here, don't we? Well, first of all, we have to find a way for the Logic app to say, I'm interested in tag reads. Please send me your tag reads. Because until it does that, our device doesn't know what to do with them. It doesn't know where to send them or anything else. So even though it would make sense to start where the data starts most often, in this case, it's going to make sense to start with where we register our interest for the data, which is going to be in a push trigger API app in Azure. Now, in reality, this is just an API app project. In fact, this is the default one. There's still the values controller that it gives me by default with a bunch of placeholder garbage that I don't need and a bunch of wasteful using directions. Look at all that. A great amount saying, no, you're not using those at all. Lies. All right. So we're going to go ahead and change this so that it allows a logic app to call in and say it's interested in some data. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to delete everything because none of that is useful for us. And then we're going to rename this because values, that's a terrible name. We're not storing values. Well, I mean, I guess we are. It's just a really generic name. This is maybe our callbacks controller. I'm storing callback numbers or callback addresses in this case. Uh, that I can use to then call back to the Logic app. Now, usually what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the uh, uh, route prefix attribute at the top of my controller just to define how we get to this controller. So how does an HTTP request know that it's going to be executing code inside of this class? So in this case, if there's an incoming HTTP request that begins with callbacks, so it's whatever address dot com slash callbacks, then I know, okay, it's going to be some method inside of here. And then the method inside of there that I want to basically receive that information into, I'm going to start just with a, a void method. We'll kind of adjust this as we go along. It is going to be a method called register callback. All right, so this is where it's going to be coming in. And so for this one, I'm going to say that the route is going to be 
I don't know, some trigger ID, some logic app name. So callback slash my logic app will allow me to uh, you know, mess with callbacks for that specific logic app. And in this case, if we're registering a callback, if we're putting something there, the HTTP verb, sorry, uh, I'm saying words but not typing those same words. I don't want to type those same words. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, listen to the HTTP verb of put. So if someone wants to put a callback uh, for a certain logic app there, we can certainly allow that to flow into this method. So that kind of gets a request into this code. But this code doesn't do the right thing yet because there were two responsibilities of a logic app, uh, sorry, of a push trigger. So two responsibilities of a push trigger. Responsibility number one, maybe we'll make this really clear that's not the start of a list in reverse. Um, responsibility number one is to store the callback for later use. Responsibility number two is to report back that everything worked. All right, so that's all I have to do. It's as easy as one, two. There's not even a three there. That would be really cool if there was, but there's not. All right, so how do we get it to that point? Well, first of all, to report back, we kind of need to not return void. So let's return something a little bit more reasonable, like async task of HTTP response message. Now, I know some of you in the audience are saying, no, what about IHTTP action result? Well, you know what? I'm going to use a task of HTTP response message, and that's going to be OK because, well, it's just OK. The, uh, the Azure SDK, if we look at the uh, uh, App Service SDK specifically, uh, it's uh, extension methods that interact with uh, the Logic App runtime all return HTTP response message. And yes, I could wrap that, but we're not going to. All right, so we're going to do HTTP response messages back. The way that we report back that everything worked, and I'm going to go ahead and just start there, is by saying request dot push. Uh, oh, you know what? We don't have the using directive yet for the Azure App Service SDK. But the uh, extension method would have been push trigger registered. In this case, I got the red squiggly hit control period to find out why. And it says, hey, you forgot to add a using directive. Yeah, I forgot. That's all right. So I'm going to press Enter. And it'll add that for me. And I'll see that in order to register the push or to report back that everything worked, I have to have the callback. I have to prove it. Darn, I was going to get away with writing an easy line of code. So where do we get this client trigger callback? Well, I'll tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to do the thing that looks like it should be the case. It, it looks like, well, maybe it's just going to pass that in as a parameter. Maybe I need a parameter there, and it'll know what to do. It's not going to be a direct parameter. It's going to be kind of messy. So we're going to put this code on hold. We'll set it over here for a minute behind a comment, and we'll come back. So where do we get that callback from? Well, first of all, we've already made a promise that there's going to be a trigger ID coming in, and we haven't really acted on that. So I'm going to go ahead and add that trigger ID parameter, so we've at least satisfied that part of it. But the second thing we're going to need, because trigger ID is not the callback, is we need the callback. Now, in the slides, we saw that that's going to be handled by our trigger input class. Now, our trigger input class is a generic class. And it has a, an implementation that takes in a type parameter of input and one that provides both an input and output. The input is the configuration for the push trigger. So in the case of our NFC push trigger, it's simply do we want duplicate tag reads or not? That's our configuration. So over in my shared project, which I've already referenced, there's a data model for my push trigger configuration. And uh, push trigger configuration. If we look at that, so I'm just going to peek its definition here, it's empty at the moment. There is no configuration. Ultimately, I want to add some. I want there to be a property that's a Boolean value called suppress duplicates. Now, if I add that, everything will work. The Logic Apps Designer will show it whenever I add my trigger. It'll say, do you want to suppress duplicates? But it'll say suppress duplicates, all one word, kind of robotic-like. No description, won't look really nice. And so this is where we bring in the metadata attribute 
from the T-Rex metadata library. All right, so we had to add a new get package called T-Rex without a dash, that's the name of the package. And uh, so that's from the T-Rex metadata namespace. And then I can put any name on that I want. Maybe suppress duplicates with a space. And I can add a description. Uh, send the same, or sorry, I guess we're suppressing duplicates. Do not send the same tag read twice in a row. All right, so we can actually add a nice pretty description around that. So maybe that's what my configuration looks like. Now the second type parameter is the output. What does it look like when I'm actually calling the logic app? What does the logic app receive? Well, in this case, I have a push, push trigger output class that's going to be the shape of that data. Now sadly, again, if I look at my push trigger output, it's very much empty. There is no push trigger output yet. So I'm going to define the shape of that data. I'm going to say that we're probably just going to send in the raw tag read as a B64 string. So maybe I call it tag read B64 and maybe I add some metadata around that. Of course, as I hit the up arrow, it doesn't go up to the next line. Let's go to the end. So it wasn't done with the snippet yet. All right, so there's metadata. And I'm going to go ahead and give it a name of um, base64 NFC read or something like that. That's what it'll show up like in the designer. And this is the raw tag data read from the NFC tag. Wow, that looks really terrible because it said tag twice. And we're going to leave it like that. Even worse. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close that. So we have the shape of our configuration, the shape of our output. And all of this is going to be coming in to a parameter called parameters. Hmm. So what do we do with this? Well, parameters will have the callback I need to register indirectly. It'll also have an instance of the configuration as populated by the logic app. And it will have the shape of the output, but it won't actually have output, obviously. My trigger hasn't fired here. This is where it's registering the callback. So we're going to go ahead and bring this line of code back to life. And for registering my push trigger to report back that everything worked, I need to call into that parameters uh, parameter and say, give me the callback, and it'll give me the callback. Now, that is a client trigger callback instance. That instance has a property called callback URI. That is an address, a web address. It's an endpoint that I can go to that is that logic app. And in fact, it has credentials baked into that address for if I needed to call to that logic app. It's pretty cool. We're going to be using to invoke it. So we need to store that value in, in more ways than just feeding it back and saying, yes, I can prove to you that I got the callback. So how do we store it? Well, we can store it in any way we want. SQL database, Azure table storage, SQL Azure. We can write it on paper. We can have it send an email to someone to write down on paper as long as there's an automated process to read that back off the paper and they can type it back in. Any way to store data is, is okay as long as it's persistent enough. So in this case, I'm going to use a Windows Azure mobile app because at the time I built the sample, that sounded like a great idea. After having built the sample, that was massive overkill for what I was trying to do. But I got to play with uh, mobile apps, so there's that. For the second sample that we show, uh, which is kind of more pre-built and ready to go for you, is, uh, is going to be our push button push trigger, and that one actually uses uh, Azure Table Storage, a lot, lot more lightweight. So we need to store the callback for later use, which means I need to write out to an Azure mobile app. Now to do that, I'm going to cheat because it would be a lot of code to write and it would be really boring code to watch being uh, written. So I'm going to bring back to life a data access class. And so here I have an Azure mobile app callback store. Now internally at QuickLearn, we actually use this interface as, long, as well as one on the client side for interacting with callback stores, realizing that push triggers are 90% boilerplate code, we decided to create an interface for this is what it looks like to save a callback and to read a callback. One that you'd use in a push trigger, one that you'd use in a client that's actually generating these events. 
you can get that interface as well and some helper classes around it. As part of the Quick Learn Push Trigger tools, there's two different uh, NuGet packages. One of them is quicklearn.logicapps.pushtrigger, and the other one I believe is quicklearn.logicapps.pushclient. And in uh, proper procrastinator fashion, I pushed a new version this last night for the purposes of my talk today. So there's a brand new version of that uh, for my second sample that allows for invoking a callback without actually having data to send to the Logic app, just kind of as a signal, I fired. All right, so within that callback store interface, it defines basically two different methods, write callback and delete callback. And uh, you don't need to see my credentials, we'll hide those. Baked into the code, so bad. Um, so within the write callback async, we're going to take in the trigger ID, the name of the Logic app, its callback URI, and then whatever configuration it wanted. And we're going to write that out to our mobile app. And there's actually code you can see here to go out, look up any items out there in the table. If there's an item, update it. Otherwise, if there's not an item, uh, basically create a brand new one. All right, so it's kind of the, the code that you might expect for that scenario. But it's basically boilerplate code, uh, boilerplate code rather, to, to write uh, callback data to an Azure mobile app. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our callbacks controller where we're waiting to store that callback for later use, and uh, I'm going to new, new up an instance of that iCallback store of um, push trigger configuration. Uh, so we can't new up uh, you know, automatically. We have to actually type the name of the concrete uh, uh, class that we're after here. So it's Azure Mobile App Callback Store. I hope. can't remember exactly. That is the one. All right. See, this is where, you know, if you're used to using Autofact, you don't really think about the names. <laughs> Just kind of, yeah, I have an instance because my constructor asked for it. Uh, all right, so callback store dot write callback async. We're going to give it the trigger ID that we already have because the Logic App theoretically gave it to us. We're going to get the callback URI that we have in our parameters get callback, callback URI, and our configuration that was also passed in through the parameters as our inputs. So again, that's the way our, our Logic App gives us that data. Now that is an asynchronous call, so we are going to await that as we write the callback. At that point, we have done everything that we need to do except for actually returning anything. So I'm going to return the fact that we registered the push trigger. So this is happy. Everything's great. If I were to deploy this right now, it would work and it would look awful. Because it would say, instead of, you know, what do you want to trigger this logic app? It'll say, oh, register callback should trigger it. Instead of saying that, I want it to say something meaningful, like NFC tag read just happened. That's what triggers the logic app. To do that, I have to add metadata to this. And in fact, it won't technically work. I, there is one other thing. I have to tell the logic app that this is a trigger. So I'm going to use the trigger attribute. And I'm going to say, yes, this is a trigger. And the trigger type, oops, capital T, there we go, is a push trigger. And the uh, response type, the well, not response, but you know, the thing it sends back, is our push trigger output, which is kind of redundant for a push trigger. Necessary for a polling trigger, though. Uh, and as far as metadata around this, I want this to say NFC tag read. That's what this should look like is triggering the process. NFC tag was read at some remote device. All right, that's the description of the thing that triggers this. So there's enough metadata there now. We also have a call within our Swagger config file in the app start. Wow, that just opened. Didn't mean to open that yet. We'll go with it. Uh, to release the T-Rex. So that's already in place to go out there and release the T-Rex. Great, we wrote a lot of code. That's a lot of boilerplate though. It boils down to get a callback in with configuration, store the callback with configuration, and report that it worked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy that NFC push trigger um, API app. So I'm going to right click and say publish. And that launches the publish web dialog where I actually have an option specific to logic apps or uh, API apps rather. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. 
and that will allow me to create a new container in the cloud for an API app. But it won't actually publish it. It goes and creates the container, and then I have to go through the wizard again to do the actual publish. So here I'm going to use my ultimate subscription. Apparently I have two premiums. That's nice. Uh, I'm going to use my ultimate subscription because it has more monies. I love those Azure bucks. All right. And uh, I'm going to be able to select here then my uh, app service plan called AzureCon. So I uh, had that provisioned already. I'm going to go out and publish out to there. And I'll say this is available to anyone, so I want to allow anonymous access to that and everything else. And it's going to say, okay, this is going to take a while. So I will acknowledge that it will take a while, and I will let it go and do its thing. So it's provisioning out a location in the cloud for me to publish this application to or this, uh, this API app to. Now, while it's thinking about that, there's still work to get done. Because this just allows the logic app to say, hey, I'm interested in, in a callback. But we don't have the logic to actually invoke that callback anywhere. Remember, on my device, we were reading a tag, and then we threw it away. We did nothing with it. We said, okay, that's nice. That's cute. That is a tag. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. So we need this to now go and look up who's interested in that tag read and let them know about it. So again, in the same way, I have some data access code that's going to be going out to an Azure mobile app, the same one, in fact. It's going to try to get a table of all the callback items that are out there, and it's going to enumerate through, load in their configuration, load in the callback addresses, and give those back to me so that I can actually call them back. Now, this callback class, that is part of the quicklearn dot push triggers. Sorry, uh, quicklearn dot uh, logic apps. What is it called here? Yes, quicklearn.logicapps.push client package. So that's where you get that callback class on the client side that you can simply call invoke from. All right, so we have a data access class. We don't need to know what that looks like. We just need to know that we're calling it and getting data because we can get data from anywhere, wherever those callbacks are stored. So here what we're going to say is I have a callback store, which is going to be a client callback store. And for my client callback store, I'm going to want to know the shape of the configuration that I can see inside of it, in this case, push trigger configuration, and the type of the output that I'm going to be able to send through it, uh, or through any of those callbacks. And in this case, it is my push trigger output. And uh, that's going to be a new Azure mobile app callback store. All right. So really long class name. Fantastic. So with the client callback store, I have a single method. Read the callbacks that has just faded out on me. So it's read callbacks async. There's no parameters. It's just read the callbacks. And because it's async, I'm going to go ahead and await it. And because I awaited it, we need to finally upgrade this Lambda to async status. Beauty. All right, so we're going to get all those callbacks. Now, we're not going to await it and throw it away. We're going to store it. And then we're going to enumerate through, or we're going to iterate through, rather, all those callbacks that we've enumerated. And we're going to check the configuration. So if we suppress duplicates and we're dealing with a duplicate tag read, then we just want to continue the next callback. Otherwise, we're going to invoke it. And we're going to invoke it by passing in a new push trigger output, which inside of that output, hang on a minute, that's async as well, so let's go ahead and await that. Um, inside that output, we have a tag read B64 waiting for tag data. We have that tag data because we read it up above. So I'm going to go ahead and just pass it along to the logic app. All right, so to invoke the logic app, because we're using the uh, quick learn .logic -apps push client, we have that callbacks class that we can just say invoke async. We feed it the output, and it automatically uh, wraps around that the, the proper shape of the object and invokes the correct HTTP location. 
So I knew up one of those callback classes, I just need the address that the logic app gave me with all the credentials baked in and it handles the rest. Pretty nice, so that's what that looks like. So at this point, we should have a container waiting for code up in Azure. So I'll publish it to actually put that code there. And as I do that, switch over to debug mode so I can actually debug if I needed to. And we have code ready to go on the device side. So we could go run it. But do you know what happened if we ran it? Nothing. It would go in and read the data and would say, okay, there's no callbacks, goodbye. There's not a logic app that says it's interested in the data yet. But when this window opens here, that proves that the mechanism to store that data is available. So let's go out and get a logic app that's actually interested in this stuff so we can actually test it, because that, that's kind of the exciting part. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. My Microsoft account, not my work and school account, not my uh, organizational ID. All right, so I'm going to get logged in. And I'll be looking at the lovely, beautiful, brand new, shiny Azure portal with my dashboard. It's not my starboard. That's my dashboard now. Uh, and on my dashboard, I have a few different things. One of those is a logic app, hence the rocket ship, uh, titled NFC Lead Import. And in my NFC lead import, I have two actions and no triggers. In other words, there's nothing that can cause this flow to happen yet. We have an in-depth parser API app, and we have a Salesforce connector API app. Now, maybe you're looking at that and saying, sorry, in-depth parser, what? What does that even mean? I've never seen that in the marketplace. And you would be correct. So remember, we're building the equivalent of an adapter, it's getting a raw stream of bytes. We have to translate that into something meaningful. That raw stream of bytes is a multi-part in-depth message. That in-depth message is typically going to be on an NFC tag, and we could have the adapter have the logic to parse it out, but the logic to parse that out is insane because there's so many different kinds of records that could be there. And so rather than writing out some general purpose way to parse out every, uh, every message ever that could possibly be there, I decided to implement that as an API app that acts kind of like a pipeline component that is purpose built for the scenario where we have a V card, a virtual business card in that uh, in-depth record. So that in-depth parser API app is actually sample code that you can get right now over on GitHub at this crazy long address. So if you snap a cell phone picture, you could get that right now. Otherwise, you can just wait till after the talk and I'll put all the links up. All right, so this uh, basically takes in the base64 tag read and gives us out your name and your email. With your name and email, or with someone's name and email, that's enough to go out to Salesforce and then create a lead. So we're going to go and read from the NDEF parser step information out to be able to create a lead out in sales Salesforce. So that's going to work pretty nicely for us. Unfortunately, we have a to-do message there. There's no base64 tag read yet. And we don't have a trigger. So I'm going to look in the API apps, and I'll notice that ever since publishing that push trigger, I have the option to use it. So I'm going to click on it, hope for the press, because you never know. I could have broken something along the way. It looks like it worked, though. So I, I saw a glimmer of hope. It's going to allow me to select NFC tag read. So what triggers this? An NFC tag read. Now, if I wasn't using T-Rex there, it would say register callback triggers this. That doesn't make sense. So I'm going to click on NFC tag read. If I'm curious as to what that means, I get a nice description. All right, do we suppress duplicate tag reads? I'm going to say true. That's, that's definitely true that we would want to suppress those duplicates. So I'm going to click on the checkbox, and that'll save that. But there's still a step here that's to do. We need to get this base64 uh, tag data, or tag read b64, from the trigger into the next step. And so we can do that. Now I can select it from the list. Um, I've noticed that unless I click save and close and reopen this, it doesn't actually work. So we'll see no inputs available. If I save, I close, reopen, that'll be available. I don't want to do that, though. That takes time. So instead what I want to do is I want to type into this box at sign to say I'm about to type an expression, 
triggers, which is a nice function within the Logic App Workflow Definition language, which if you're curious about what that language looks like, there's a language reference button in the toolbar. And then I'm going to say dot outputs, um, because this actually has some outputs it's sending to the Logic App. And this is the shape of those outputs. So there's a body, and then inside the body is base64, well, what is it really? It's a tag read v64. So I have dot body dot tag read v64. Let me just verify the casing on that one last time. Yeah, I think that's right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and pass in that expression to say let's just read out what's in the trigger. And so I'll save that. Now at the moment I click save, what's happened is it's taken this configuration data and it's called the method that we wrote. That method grabs the uh, you know, callback URL and stores that in the Azure mobile app. Now we're going to see that in a few places. The most obvious place is going to be in the SQL database that backs that mobile app. So if I go out to uh, my SQL Server Object Explorer within Visual Studio and I go out to my push trigger store database, or my callbacks database rather, push trigger store is the uh, server. We'll watch it spin its gears. That's a circle of patience right there. It takes a few Microsoft seconds to go away. But it'll spin for a while, and then we'll be able to see inside that table the actual uh, callback data. So I'm going to go ahead and just view the data inside that table, and we'll see that it actually wrote just now as I click Save some callback data there. Or my whole screen will turn black. That's a feature. That's the turn your screen black feature of the, uh, the uh, SQL Server object, uh, uh, object Explorer. All right, we'll let that go in the background and, and turn some colors. I'm also going to show you the second place where you can see this, because uh, first place might take a minute to load. The second place we can see this is in the trigger history for the Logic App. So the Logic App, every time it calls to register the callback, it shows us the history that it did it. I can click on that, and I can see that it worked or didn't work, I can see what it fed that, uh, that push trigger. In this case, it fed it the uh, configuration of suppressed duplicates, and it fed it the callback URL. And you can see my credentials now to call this logic app if you'd like. You can certainly use that. I'll delete this after the, the call. But it basically has the full callback URL there. And I, I don't have to have something special to call that. I don't have to have any SDK. I can open up any HTTP client, feed it with basic authentication. Those credentials post to that address and I'm golden to trigger that process. All right, so that same data was stored in the database right here. I'm going to go ahead and close that before it turns black again. So let's see this in action. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and rebuild and redeploy to my local device, and then I'm going to bring this on the phone, because the end scenario is that we are running this code not only on Windows on a laptop where I bought a special NFC reader, but on a commodity handset, when I say commodity, I mean that. It was a, it was, it was a good handset in its day, but it, it barely runs Windows 10 right now. But it can handle this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, deploy that code locally and just start debugging that. And I've already done a scan of my name, but it never went anywhere, so I'm going to go ahead and scan my own data once again. This time as I do the scan, I'm going to set a breakpoint in a different location. So I'm actually going to set a breakpoint down here where we're waiting to uh, actually invoke the thing and where we're checking the configuration. All right, so I'm going to scan my conference badge. And I should see a nice little uh, pop-up window show up. I show it hits the breakpoint. I'm reading the configuration of some callback. It says to suppress duplicates. We're currently not dealing with the duplicates, so it should then continue to actually invoke the logic app with my tag data. Now at that point some really cool stuff is going to happen. I'll just leave it at that. Cool stuff happened. No, I'm just kidding. It went out to Salesforce. Oh my gosh, it went out to Salesforce. It talked to Salesforce. Just now it did that. So I'm going to go ahead and log in and we're going to look at the leads module. So I'm going to click on leads and I should see that I have a recent lead of Nick Hallenstein just showed up and uh, uh, do note that I am in Pacific time, so it is 12.46 Pacific time right now. Uh, so that just got created. 
that's incredible. That's exactly the data that was on my card. Woohoo! Now that's awesome, but I'm still kind of in a debugging experience on my laptop. This isn't real yet, it's fake. Because at a conference, I'm not going to lug around my tablet with Visual Studio running and debugging my code. I'm going to have this deployed probably on a handset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and switch this from local machine to device, from any CPU to ARM, and I'm going to go ahead and right click and deploy this to my phone. Crossing my fingers, this has not worked yet today. <laughs> my phone has a, a really shaky USB port. It's really hard to keep it plugged in. So, uh, okay. Windows Phone is not detected. We're going to try one more time. I'm going to go ahead and fiddle with my phone here, get it nice and plugged in, and hopefully held really still. So unplugging, plugging back in. And if this doesn't work, we'll just pretend that it did, because it does. Oh, oh, there it is. All right, I have a connection, I think. So we'll try one more time here. <laughs> All right, one last try. Duh. Okay. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to show on the device side. That's sad. That's all right, though, because we have a Raspberry Pi that we can show something else on. So we do get to see something running on the device. Now, I do want to show a second Tegri, though, because we only saw one. So I'm going to have my camera person here uh, basically point it back at the reader. We'll get the camera turned on. And we have a magical tag that's going to be coming through. I'm going to actually start the code, though, back on my uh, local machine again. All right, so here's the, uh, the tag read for Scott Guthrie. So showing that we can kind of make it work with more than just myself. We're going to see it comes through. We see the uh, actual uh, current tag read has Scott Guthrie's data instead of my own. And we'll see that it's going to go ahead and invoke the callback with that data. So I'm going to go ahead and click continue. And we'll see that it goes to invoke async and then we're off. If I go over to Salesforce and look at the leads, we see Scott Guthrie coming in. All right, so we've seen some really cool stuff here. It would be even cooler if the, uh, the phone could stay plugged in. But this is not where it ends. This is where it begins. I said at the beginning of the session, I don't want this to be a session where you watch some really cool stuff and then you walk away. And you say, ah, oh, that was neat. I want this to be a session where we start something. I want you to start something. I want you to build something cooler than I did. Because leads and sales don't actually inspire me. What inspires me is like NFC tags. Those are fun. What inspires me is integration. What inspires me is all this stuff in the cloud. So what I've done is I've put together the most simplistic device I possibly could hooked up to a pretty amazing little tiny computer. So a Raspberry Pi. So the most simplistic device I possibly could is a little switch that you press down to close a circuit or open a circuit, depending on what kind of switch you get. Basically changes the state of some pins on the Raspberry Pi. I put together some sample code that looks at the state of those pins. So that if the state of those pins changed, because you press down the button, it can then trigger a logic app. And in fact, I put together a sample that uses the Azure table storage to store callbacks from a push trigger and then invoke that whenever that button is pressed. So it is very much a push trigger. You push a button to trigger, play on words. Also on the slide, I've put together everything you need to build it. And in fact, you're going to have so many extra parts after buying that because you can't just get two little jumper wires at a cost-effective rate. Apparently, we're buying like 120 of them just to get two. Uh, but you're going to have a lot of extra parts. But basically, you get to build a little device. Now, you might look at that and say, well, that seems kind of dumb. Like, push a button and it triggers a logic app. Why? Well, to show what it is to build an experience. We don't have smart devices necessarily. Now, this is kind of a pretty darn smart device. We have signals. Now, what is a signal? The signal here is the button was pressed. That's a signal. Integration allows me to take into account other signals. What if the button was pressed while I had something on my calendar? 
where I was kind of, uh, do not disturb. You're not supposed to mess with me right now. I'm kind of, you know, in my zone right now, and I press the button. Maybe it treats that as a signal that I was disturbed, and, and we need to trigger something like maybe little Spheros or robot balls to go and attack people's feet and say, get out, stop disturbing him. Now, that's kind of silly, right? But what if it's more serious? Every day I, I commute for one and a half hours. And uh, a lot of that's over terrain that's fairly dangerous. Uh, I even encounter at certain parts of my, my ride uh, wild animals that could eat me. Um, basically, I walk out of my door and there's bears. <laughs> so my wife worries about me quite a bit. What if it detected I pressed the button and took into account what time it was? It said, oh, wait, you press the button and it's shortly after when you would normally arrive for work. That's another signal. What if it took into account the name of the device where the button was pressed? What if it took into account any number of signals that could mean different things? So a single signal of a button press with context that's available through integration can have a lot more meaning, can have a lot more power. So I'd encourage you to build this. And in fact, I want to show you what it looks like. I have one sitting on my desk right now. And so we'll go ahead and get the camera on it for a minute. So this is the device on the desk. Really simple circuit, little push button, right, hooked up to a Raspberry Pi. And uh, what I'm going to do is show you what it would look like to use this sample against that device and kind of give you your own little internet-enabled button. Now, Amazon has it with their dash buttons. Those are fun. But this is even better. You can trigger anything you could possibly imagine in the cloud. All right, as long as it doesn't involve correlation. Let's go out to the sample code. The sample code lives on GitHub at a really long address but also a shortened address. And so it's uh, under my, my name, Microsoft alias was Nihaui, something crazy like that. So kind of left that in my GitHub name, but that's all right. So push button push trigger is the name of the repository. I'm going to go ahead and uh, notice that we could clone it. So I'm going to grab the clone URL, and I'm going to copy and paste that into the chat window out to the entire audience. So if you want to clone this, I've copied nothing. I didn't copy that at all. Apparently, I can't copy that. We'll, we'll deal with that later. But you could clone that, and you'd end up with code. Oh, I'm debugging. That looks something like this. And so in this code that we're about to load, it's going to take the same shape as my previous sample, where I have some code in Azure, some code on my device, in this case, my Raspberry Pi, and some shared models. Now, I've tried to write this in the most generic way possible. So you'll find that my callback store doesn't really care what kind of configuration you have. It basically takes whatever you feed it, serializes as JSON, and stores it in Azure Table Store. All right, so we have a button press app uh, on the Raspberry Pi. Let's start here. We'll see that it runs as a background task. It can run in headless mode, listens to pin number four, and uh, if the value changes, it, it can basically change any time within the, the realm of 50 milliseconds and it counts as the same change. Then we look up the callbacks and we trigger a logic app. Now the place where we look up the callbacks does have to be configured and uh, I made it so that you actually have to read the code and pay attention in order to uh, use this. So uh, where we go into the data access here, there's a uh, Azure storage config in both the push trigger side and the Raspberry, uh, Raspberry Pi side, so we have a Azure storage config. Both of those want a connection string to a cloud storage account. All right, so we're going to give it a connection string to cloud storage, and then it's usable at that point. So I have a cloud storage account over here on my uh, dashboard called Callbacks. Apparently, I got dibs on that name before anyone else. That's incredible. All right, so I'm going to use my Callback storage account. To do that, I need the access keys. Now, you're going to see these keys. I will be deleting this after. Uh, please don't delete it or touch things while I'm working on it here in the, in the session, though. And I'm going to take that connection string, and I'm going to paste it right there, because we're not going to use config files. That would be too meaningful and correct. We're going to hard code it, because that feels wrong and evil. And we're going to hack something together here. We're going to have some fun. All right, so with that all nicely filled in so it actually has access, 
uh, I'm basically going to go ahead and deploy my push button push trigger up into Azure. So I'll have a push trigger for a Logic App that can register its interest in, uh, in button presses. So we'll see that that'll go out and publish. It'll do the package restore uh, necessary. And uh, what I'd like to do as it's publishing is I'd like to actually build a Logic App that uses it. Now I'm going to do something that's really simplistic just to show that we can trigger it. But again, the sky is the limit. You can use your imagination here. All right, so out in Azure, I'm going to create a simple Logic App here, push button, push trigger. It's already pre-created but empty. And inside of that, I find zero triggers and zero actions. If I click on it, I should see, hopefully, if I timed it correctly. I don't know if I did. Uh, my push button, push trigger API app show up on the right. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and create it from scratch. And just in time, I got my push button, push trigger there. So I'm going to click on that, and it's going to query the uh, metadata so it knows what's available. And I pre-built this with a push button pressed uh, operation. So I'll click on that. And we'll say that this trigger is enabled. And I'll say OK. And then just to prove that this is being called, I'm going to add an HTTP request, so an outgoing HTTP request. And in this case, I'm just going to make a post to some address. And uh, because we want to be able to see that address, I'm going to use request bin, uh, which is a nice service to just capture uh, incoming HTTP requests to some endpoint. So it gives me a nice endpoint here to post to and a nice inspection endpoint to see what got posted to that address. So I'm going to post it to that address. And for my body, I'm just going to say, ah, execute the triggers um, uh, function and just dump the output of that. All right, so I'll go ahead and click Save. So I have a Logic App in the cloud that's listening for button presses. Clicking Save will register the callback that says, please send me data about button presses. If a button press comes in, if the callback is invoked, I should be able to refresh this page and see information about that request. So with that, I'm going to take my code that goes on my Raspberry Pi. I'm going to set a breakpoint right about here, where we're checking if the button pin value changed. In other words, if the button was pressed. And I'm going to go ahead and debug that uh, on my remote machine, so it's going to be using an ARM machine. It's going to be remote. And as part of that, it has to build, has to kind of construct the layout and then do a deployment. All right, so build is started. Deploy is started. Uh, it's getting ready to copy the files over the network. And again, as it's running this code, remember that it is running on the Raspberry Pi. So this isn't running on my laptop. But this is running on the Raspberry Pi. So take my laptop out of the picture. This would still execute. It would still work. And in fact, we've had one in operation in the classroom now for the last two weeks. And uh, my daughter actually helped me build it. And it's uh, made of Lego and Raspberry Pi. It's wonderful. All right, you can do it. 22 megs over the network. Go, go, go. It's one of those moments where you say, hmm, that was going to take 30 Microsoft seconds. Maybe that should have been pre-deployed, but then that would have been cheating, right? So this is going to be the last thing we see as part of the talk. I know we're pretty close to time, but hoping that that... Uh, Gets deployed pretty nice. Oh, there it is. All right, so it's registering the application. That's a good sign. And then it should start it up, and then the uh, debugger will attach to it. So we can kind of see that it's executing. All right. 
So this is a headless app. Uh, another thing to mention, uh, if you were to uh, basically create a new Windows Universal app project, you get a main page, you get a UI, Raspberry Pi is capable of showing the UI uh, and, and definitely running an app like that. In this case, we went headless so that we could uh, actually run it without a UI, kind of running as a background service on startup. That does take some extra configuration when you want to run it without the debugger. So if you did want to run this without the debugger, you do have to configure Windows IoT to start uh, this headless app essentially as a service upon startup of the device. All right. Certainly that should be done by now, but it is still copying. Why don't we uh, open the floor for any questions? There's only one more slide uh, while this is going, and we'll show this working kind of after we uh, tackle a few questions. So, uh, Michael, are there any questions out there in, in chat or, or otherwise that are interesting? Hey, Nick. Um, there's not at the minute, but uh, I guess if we let everybody now type all their questions, okay. and, uh, we'll just give it a couple of minutes to see what comes through. I'll just quickly check Twitter as well. Hey, so, so we had this last week where um, everyone was really quiet on the questions, then we got a little burst of them all came in at once. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so here we go. Uh, should now be executing. I can definitely see lights going crazy on the Raspberry Pi, so that's a, that's a decent sign that it's actually executing there. Uh, it's going to be trying to attach the debugger now, so it's connecting to the remote debugger service. That uh, breakpoint light up as that assembly is loaded, and uh, we'll definitely be able to hit the button now. All right, so I'm going to turn on my camera actually, and we're going to see the button get pressed. Ready? Here we go. We're going to press the button. There it is. It has been pressed. Hopefully, there it is. Point has been hit. So that's uh, good enough now to go out and read from the callback store. So it's going to go out, it's going to read from the callback store, it's going to invoke the uh, callback asynchronously. And then what I would expect is if we go out to the browser and refresh the request bin, we should have a request from that logic app uh, that was executed posting back to it. Otherwise, it might not have registered the callback yet or it hasn't read the callback or it's still executing. So we can check on that pretty easily. So we'll see in the uh, trigger history that we had a successful registration of the callback. And then I would expect then, at any moment, we would have a run of that, although it's not showing any runs. So I am going to just double check one last thing. We're going to press it again, but I'm going to set a breakpoint later on after it's kind of resolved and looked up those callbacks just to make sure everything is uh, in order. All right, so it goes out to the callback store. And then as far as the callbacks return from the store, looks like we do have one callback. All right, and let's make sure that we have an address associated with that. We do. So in that case, looks like that's all in the up and up. It might have just been that I, uh, my uh, HTTP post step. Oh, no, it came through. Just a little bit delayed. All right, so I got two of those in. And so now I have a push button that can trigger logic in the cloud and do anything I need it to do. All right, so with that, what do we do now? Well, you can read the NFC push trigger write-up and source code uh, at the link at the top. I have a hackathon this weekend in Seattle if any of you want to make the flight over or make the flight over virtually, because it's also going to be a virtual thing. If you want to build some of this stuff, uh, so think about some of the, the connectors that you would like to see in the cloud. I'm going to talk basically for a day about how to, uh, well, not the whole day, half the day, about how to actually build uh, different kinds of API apps, and then you get a chance to do it. We we're actually going to coordinate uh, among attendees and build things together that are of interest to attendees in common. And then uh, you could potentially say that, well, I want to take a class on this stuff. There's a, a class right there where we actually give out a push button push trigger kit for you to build and then of course I'm going to write all the stuff up that we talked about today so that's going to be out there so you can take a photo of that slide other than that uh, I'm available for questions now and I'd love to hear from you let's get the questions 